Have you ever felt like you plum forgot how to breathe? <laughs> well, folks, let me just tell you, if you ever get a bull elk screaming in your face at 10 yards, just remember these words from old Big O, breathe, baby. <laughs> there is nothing like chasing bulls in the archery season. But for longtime rifle hunters moving to the bow for the first time, well, that's just a little bit different. On today's show, Joe and I talk about how to help those guys and gals making that switch. We'll talk about changes in style, changes in equipment, changes in habits. And the biggest question we get is, where do we get started calling? Those topics, along with our Elk Bros shout outs and questions from our Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair. Adjust your volume just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk, and they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of the show, coming to you from Spring, Texas. And joining me from New Mexico, your elk hunting coach, Joe Gillia. What's up, Joe? And I'm ready to go, Gilbert. We got some good stuff to talk about tonight, man. Questions no are Big rolling questions in, man. Are coming in, Joe. <laughs> yeah, it's like every day, man, questions are hitting the mailbox, which is awesome. Guys, keep sending those questions and we'll just keep rocking on them. And uh, Gilbert, last last show, we introduced our new segment. Yep. Uh, we started our EBD series for you guys that, you know, if you don't remember, that's our elk behavior database and so we're going to kind of alternate between our mailbox and our ebd segment one one or the other and uh i was i really had a good time with that and i really think that's a cool thing for these people that are that Man, listening great to the show. content i've had nothing but great feedback from it all week long joe well, I'd really, listeners out there, do us a favor, pop us an email, do a review, whatever it takes, but let us know what you think about that EBD segment. If that's something that uh, you really got something out of, you want us to continue, you're feeling good about it, just drop a line and say, love the EBD, all right? And uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> you sure you didn't say CBD, I Joe? did not oh! say CBD. <laughs> I didn't say that, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, you know exactly what time it is, brother. Shout it's out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout, shout out. shout out. If you're new to our show, these are just a few cities topping our charts this week. Yep. And first of all, a shout out to some of our grinders that have leaving reviews out there on Apple Podcasts. Those puppies are climbing up there. I love no that, doubt. man. Jonathan from Missouri, the Kentucky Elk Hunter, and Big D from Edgewood, Washington. Guys, thank you for your reviews. Uh, we really the appreciate Kentucky that. The Kentucky Elk Hunter. I like that. The from Kentucky. the Bluegrass State in Kentucky, Joe. Yes, sir. And man. I hear they got some big elk out there. They man. got some, you know, and it, it's a, it's, uh, it's a tough hunt because you look at how beautiful and green it is and, you know, it's perfect country for an elk. The only problem is, man, is it's hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can, be, it can be pretty stealth, steamy and, and uh, it'd be like on elk here in Texas in September. Whew, man, you better get the swimming pool ready because I'm telling you, it is super duper hot yeah. uh, and, and humid too, you know, mm -hmm. I've talk to some of those guys up in PA and even even uh, in Kentucky and say, man, it's hot. And look, it's farmland too that they're hunting. Right. You know, so it's just thick, thick woods and mots and big farmland country and stuff. I, I just think it's pretty cool to wake up in the morning and go hear some bull elk. Oh, man, no mountain. kidding. Out there in the bluegrass state, man. <laughs> you know, yes, I can just imagine some of them horses when they see an elk come in like, what? You no, know? Doubt. no doubt. All right, so let's get started. Up first, located where you can still feel the heartbeat of the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area, it's the third fastest growing city in the country, Gilbert. 
At their Chestnut Square Historical Park, you can slip back in time with folks that wear period costumes, and they do demos of the, how they lived in the days gone by. No but doubt. Gilbert, we know Texans love their barbecue, and they say crowds here head to where they pile it big at Guys Hutchins Barbecue in none other than McKinney, Texas. Yeah. Hey, McKinney, Texas showing up in the house. I'm telling you right now, been to Hutchins Barbecue on North Tennessee Street. Yeah, I have I have tasted that. I mean, colossal goodness of barbecue now. <laughs> well, they've also got a store in Frisco, Texas. You know, we play a lot of ball up there in the Dallas DFW area, Joe. Uh-huh. So, you know, Joe Soy, I'm going to find a good barbecue uh, around there and the, and the good uh, eating joints up there. Hutchins Barbecue is the real deal. They're on, on uh, North Tennessee Street, man. It's good stuff there in the McKinney area. <laughs> You know, when you're doing searches on cities and stuff to find out things about them and and to get some facts and histories, when a place keeps ringing out like like that did, yeah, you know that that's an area favorite, man. And I hear people just line up for this place, and it's well, look, I mean, it it used to be back in the day, it used to be Roy's Smokehouse. Oh, okay, and. and the dad finally decided he was going to pass it down to the three sons. I uh-huh. can't remember their names, but I've been in that place several times. So I kind of know a little bit of history about it. Uh-huh. Uh, I promise you, I hadn't done a whole lot of homework on it or anything. I mean, I just <laughs> got to look at the, what we're doing right now. But at the end of the day, Hutchins Barbecue is a big deal up in McKinney, Texas. They also got a new store in Frisco where they do most of their catering out of. Oh, guys, man. So you guys got the tip. You head in that part of the country. Go in there and tell them that uh, ec- the Elk Bros sent you. All no right? doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Yeah. Maybe I'll get me a free plate of barbecue or something when I go back, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, up next. Our next place is just opposite of McKinney in a lot of ways, huh. known as the Holy Island. It's less than 10 square miles. It has about 250 residents, and it's the smallest island in the middle of Washington's San Juan Islands. There is a general store at the ferry landing, but no market, no restaurants, and only 100-year-old cottage for short-term stays. No longer today, but at one time, for 27 straight years, every ferry that landed here was met by Franciscan Nun. By Franciscan, uh, I guess that would be Franciscan or Francescan. That'd be nun. Franciscan. You got it. Yeah, yeah. Franciscan nun wearing a reflective vest <laughs> over her brown habit, uh, and that is in none other than Shaw Island, Washington. Uh, Shaw Island, man, Washington. You guys are just the bomb, and I'm oh, trying to island. figure out. I mean, Shaw Island has 250 residents. They're top on our charts with the amount of listens this week. I don't know if they're passing it around or somebody's listening a lot. Uh, awesome, I don't know if man. they wanted to get you know on on the map with Elk Bros. But I tell you what, man, if you if you guys don't know where this is, it's between Victoria Island and 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 can right up there in the northern part of of Washington, right on on the water there. But you know, because you can go from Port Angeles up to Victoria Island, and then you can head uh, east over towards right. the San Juan Islands that are in the middle of the water there. And mm-hmm. the the uh, Shaw Island is located right in the middle of three other ones. It's just a cool setup, man. And, and they get everything from this inner uh, ferry that goes from island to island. And what wow. A, what a cool place, man. Yeah, I showed it to Loretta, and Loretta, she wants to go visit it, man. I mean, right away. Heck, yeah. It looked like a cool place to go visit. It was, it was, Although, I mean... They ain't got no restaurants, Joe. So where <laughs> where you go eat? I guess you got to get some one of them old people to put you up and Heck maybe yeah. make you old spam sandwiches and fried <laughs> taters or something, man. And that is the second time this week I've heard spam, y'all. And let me tell you what. Uh, yeah, I had somebody that showed a big old picture, a whole bunch of spam, and they were like, "How do you feel about spam?" I was like, Look, "Round steak." Oh, dude. I had spam and eggs. I had fried spam. I had Heck ground yeah. spam and mayonnaise. I had, I had spam every way a person could eat it as a kid. <laughs> and I, I ain't touching no more. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> All right. Next up, 
Once a year, fish fly here, blue angels nest there, and Don Shirley was born there. Now, I, I know a lot of y'all look at that and you're like, hmm. So in 1978, a musician, Jimmy Lewis, began the now famous, it draws Gilbert tens of thousands of people, the Flora Bama Mullet Toss Beach Party. <laughs> oh, man. So he, this, this musician had gone to Oklahoma and seen people throw cow chips. And so oh, yeah. he, they, they know cow chips where they're at, but he saw a mullet jumping out of the water one time and thought, Hmm. <laughs> and thus the Florabama mullet toss beach party was started. All right. Wow. And the blue angels, man. I mean, my childhood, the blue angels, yeah. Uh, they're the Naval Flight Demonstration Team that is based at Sherman Field in this city. And for those of y'all that don't know who Don Shirley is, in the 1960s, let's see if you pick this up, he's a classical musician that embarked on a concert tour that included the Deep South. For part of the tour, he hired a bodyguard and a driver, New York nightclub bouncer Tony the Lip Bayalanga, right? Yeah. Their story what is is what inspired the 2019 Oscars Best Picture film, Green Book. Really? Yes, sir. All of this <laughs> takes place in Pensacola, Florida. Been through that town many days going to Florida, Joe. Yeah. Playing ball down there. Man, you got to go through Pensacola on I-10. Yeah, Pensacola, man. A, Pensacola a lot happening in that up. place. No doubt. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Well, next up, Joe, the fourth largest city in Oregon is located 30 minutes from Portland at the mouth of the Columbia River Gorge. We all know Oregon means outdoor fun, and true to that, you can check out the Oxbow Regional Park. Visit the Japanese gardens and take in the incredible views of Mount Hood. This all is in Grisham, Oregon. Gresham, Oregon in the house. Thank you yes, guys, sir. man. Again, Oregon, man. Oregon's coming up all the time. And uh, <clears throat> man, I, we sure appreciate all y'all listeners out there. Last but not least, located in the southern end of Salt Lake Valley, this bedroom community was agricultural in its roots and was originally refer referred to as Garnerville, changed its name to reflect a handful of creeks and small rivers that ran through the area. And we know why these guys and gals listen in because, buddy, Gilbert, man, this country is so beautiful. They're only 30 minutes away from incredible lakes, hiking, and hunting. And a lot of people, wow. they miss out on this destination. They kind of get surrounded by a lot of these other states. But let me tell you, man, this is an incredible state to elk hunt. And this place, our listeners, Riverton, Utah. Riverton, Utah in the yep. house. There they are, man. That's uh, fantastic. Yeah. You know, our listeners are really starting to crop up from that West Coast area, man. Up there with all them big Thule's and uh, Roosevelt elk and stuff yeah, like oh, yeah. that are. Yeah. You know, I, in fact, I had somebody else just talking about that, about going and uh, hunting that area in Oregon. And, you know, it's um, if you've never been to that old, that old um, forest that they have there, it's just incredible. And I mean, it looks like a daggum jungle. It's yeah. thick, 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 you know, and uh, I tell you that just, I bet every shot you get there once a bull gets in is going to be close, man, because. Yeah, you know, uh, there's some farmland up there too, because my, my brother, our elk brother, Trey Kistler, uh -huh. he killed his bull up there in Oregon, and uh, <clears throat> he killed it there at, uh, I want to say it's at uh, Gary Loomis's place up there. But anyway, uh, he kept What part of Oregon was that? Was it like mid or you know, eastern? Or? I think it's somewhere closer to Salem. I'm not 100% uh -huh. sure. But, uh, you know, it was a 25-year plan in the, in the making for old Trey, and he got it done with his bow. And uh, he just got the mount back, I think, day, yesterday or day before I saw it on his Instagram where he got it back. I told him to flip us a picture of it, and we blew oh, cool. it up. Oh, yeah. that's awesome, man. Well, I, sure. I, I tell you, I've been to that. Oregon down the coast up through the middle out in the prairie out there and that country there you get around bend reminds me a lot of New Mexico really yeah. does man just with yeah. bigger rivers you know it's you really bet. really beautiful rivers man yeah, so you ready to get started on our topic bud I am brother I mean you know 
I can't wait for you to dive into this to help these rifle hunters make that transition, Joe. Well, that, I, we've been getting a lot of questions from rifle hunters that are they're saying, you know, that you know, I hunted with the bow as a kid, and now I've been hunting with the rifle, and I really want to get started. But uh, one guy was talking about how, uh, you know, he was hunting, and he, you know, he would smell elk, uh, and he'd see sign, but you know, he never ever got to see the hide nor hair of one because he was hunting them like a rifle hunter. And, you know, he was asking a lot of questions. They were asking about setups. They were asking about styles, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you've gotten to experience both those. And as a guide, I get an opportunity to experience both those, but it's definitely a change in style, Gilbert, because I, I have buddies that kind of disagree a little bit with me on this, but you know, me too. And I was <laughs> going to lead into that and, and look you know, I got buddies of mine disagree on the deer hunting side. I mean, I do, it doesn't matter if I can hunt a deer with a pitchfork, I'm going to get after it. Right. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, guys support one another, quit, oh, yeah. quit bagging, quit bagging on one another on how we want to hunt or how we want to harvest an animal. I was, uh, I, I try not to get into altercations on social media, but <laughs> this cat was saying how it's just much more humane to, to you know, uh, take a take a deer or an animal with a rifle, and there's too many wounded animals with bows. And I, you know, I'm going to use my own self. I, I killed five animals this year on my ranch. Uh -huh. uh, all five, I made killing shots. I recovered all five. I, I can count a whole lot more this year on our ranch that were wounded with a gun and we did not find them. Right. So I'm going to tell you, it's all about shot placement guys. And it's all about what you love to do. Yeah. So and for, I, it doesn't matter what one another, man, it, don't, don't <laughs> get, don't get caught up in all the bashing of, you know, whether bow hunting's ethical or gun hunting or muzzleloader hunting's harder or, you know, handgun hunting. I mean, I don't care at the end of the day, enjoy the woods and enjoy one another, enjoy what God gave us. That's the bottom line, man. And we really don't need to separate each other, man. There's enough nah. people trying to do that, but no doubt. every it, day. And when I talk about <laughs> those changes in style, uh, it's, it's about experiences. You know, if, if I was somebody that I've had, you know, I've made my kills with a rifle, I might want to try something to challenge myself. I might want to try something like you were talking about earlier, man, to have the friggin' bull screaming in my face at 10 yards. I'm t <laughs> until if you, you ain't have... never done it, I promise you, it'll change your life. <laughs> it, it is, it's something that you will never forget. And ever. Yeah. And you know, the other thing is, is for guys that they give themselves that ability to either hunt with the bow or hunt with the rifle. If you're going to do multiple states or uh, you're going to apply to other states that aren't in, as a non-resident, you actually have better odds if you're applying as a bow hunter. Uh, mm -hmm. I can tell you in my state, there's guys that I know that haven't drawn an elk tag as a resident, you know, for five, six, seven years, but it's different for the bow hunters. So, uh, right. So let's talk about when, when we talk about styles on that, you know, it, it, it is different. You walk differently. You, you, you act differently. You have a whole different feel to your step instead of now being in those high locations or those areas where you can watch openings and depending on those openings for animals to step out so that you have that two, 300, 350 yard shot. Mm -hmm. Now you're, you're in a different period of time. Now there's one thing about elk Gilbert that makes them fun to hunt. And that's that they tell you where they're at. Sure, least and, the yeah, and during during the the archery season versus the rifle season, during that rifle season, I'm trying to get one to sound off so I can just locate, get in a high point, get a good shot. Sure. I'm trying to get one to locate in the archery season because now instead of just being that person that's just trying to be able to spot and get the shot, I'm trying to get that booger to come into me. So now I'm having to go in where it lives. I'm having to go in amongst them. And I have to now learn things like where do I set up? Mm -hmm. You know, instead of being at a high, good uh, platform or even down lower looking up on the side of a hill where I can scope a whole side of a hill, but it's all about your vision with the rifle. It's all about getting that good, clear shot where mm -hmm. with that bow, 
It's about knowing how to get in, knowing when to set up, how to set up, knowing that you have to draw your bow, knowing how to stop that animal, knowing, like you said, to ensure that you don't make a bad shot, knowing what type of shot you are able to make, what you're comfortable with, what your range is, and making a good clean kill. So there is a difference in style. Much in different, yeah. And the guys that were asking me, they were like, well, how do I know where and how to set up? There's going to be, I mean, we can do a whole podcast on setups, Yeah. but I just want to changes tell you. with the environment you're in so much. Yeah. You know, and I everything just. Everything changes. I, I just want to tell you guys one thing is that with the rifle, it's all about vision at a distance. With the bow, it's all about keeping it tight. So you don't want that animal, you don't want to see them at a long distance necessarily. You want your setups to be where it forces that animal to get within bow range just to have the opportunity to see you. Yeah, and then for me, Joe, it's all about wind. You, you, you just never going to get within bow range if you don't play the wind. That, you know, it's funny because I just, anymore, Gilbert, I just take that for such granted, but that's a great point. You know, anybody that has been an elk hunter or been out in these elk woods, wind is number one. That's something that if you, if you don't you have got it wind, right, you can't go after them. You no. know, you're just going to end up blowing them out of the country and you won't have them to hunt. You right. Know? Where it's not as critical when I have a rifle, you know, yeah. I, I got it this weekend and, you know, there were two setups that I had that, you know, got real good deer in them and man, the, just the wind wasn't right. And, you know, mm -hmm. some of the guys kind of got aggravated with me, but I'm like, look, I mean, we can go in there, but they ain't coming in. They're going right. to come in there, scent check where we're at, that you won't even know they were there. You're just not going to see them. So why go in there and blow them out for a week? Because, I mean, once they sent you, they ain't coming back for a couple of days, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. And in the elk woods, they might not ever come back, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you've got to do what's right with the wind uh, to start your setup, you know? And then I, I think that's where that's it all one. starts for me. Definitely. <sighs> We're checking and, it out. And, man, if we got it, let's make a plan. So, right? I, you know, you brought up another good point, And that's the other thing that I want to make is, is wind is so important. Keeping it tight so that that animal has to come in and doesn't have vision you know, of where that cow is, is calling them and has to come in and look for it. And, uh, you know, the other one is, is when you're rifle hunting, you can be down below shooting up at them or up above shooting down on them. And really with elk, if you want them in your setup to come into you, you need to make sure you're kind of at their level. You don't want any, you don't want to get up above them. You don't want to get down below them. You want to get up parallel on their level to them. So or that, call them uh, up to you. Yeah. <laughs> There's a secret to that too, man. So, uh, yeah. And that all comes in the setup. That's yeah. Right. It, it all comes into that setup, you know, making sure that, that you have that situation. Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, cause like I said, Oh, and the other part of the setup is, is understand what's happening when mm. you are, when you are hunting these guys during the bow season, you have bull elk that, are wanting to breed. That is their number one priority. They're wanting to breed. So when you are doing a setup, understand that that animal is going to try to circle downwind to scent check to find out if the cow that he's interested in is in estrus. He's going to circle around to scent check that animal and check for other bulls at the same time. So you got to think about those things when you first do your setup. You know, if you have an animal that you're hearing coming into you at a particular line, you have the wind, you need to make sure that, you know, if it's yourself, you're going to get up forward and you're going to go to the downwind side because that animal is going to try to get around you. So there's a difference in style. Now, don't think that because you're with the bow that you got to get all, all you know, light-footed and quiet and everything like that because you don't. You know, there's a time to be quiet, but... <laughs> Those critters make a lot of noise. They make a lot of noise. And if you are doing things where you're keeping your setup to where they can't see you, you making noise is not going to spook that animal off, okay? Whereas if you're rifle hunting, and, and one of my favorite times of rifle hunts when there's snow on the ground, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So, and, and you're following track or something like that. And that snow's crunchy and those elk hear that coming. Now that's a different deal, man. You yeah. know, unless you're throwing out some cow calls here and there and getting them to believe and in the story. So there is a different, there is a different style. There is a, you know, with the rifle binos. Yeah. Optics are huge. Yeah. You know, f- for me, uh, when I bow hunt and, and I have a, you know, a, uh, Trevin Stolfus believes that, you know, you do let the binos do the work for you all the time. And I, and I'm a more of a in the woods foot on the ground type of guy. Uh, I like to cover ground. I like to find sign track and figure out where those animals are. So that me, I'm, I, I like to be amongst them more as, as a bow hunter. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that, that's where that change of style is. And, and I, and that takes us into changes in the equipment besides the obvious you know, besides the obvious of, of your, you know, your, your bow and, and your, and your rifle. Yeah. Binos is one thing that we just talked about. You know? Not a hundred percent necessary uh, mm-hmm. when you're bow hunting. I use a range finder. It's got a six power on it. Right. So I can use it a lot. I mean, look for me, when I'm in the mountains, it's about staying light. Right. Cause I'm covering sure. lots of ground. And when you got a big, heavy pair of binoculars, when you take them out one day, you'll go, Oh man, this thing's a heck of a lighter right so i've always been you know and i kind of hunted with the the joe Gillia method less is more you know and when you're hunting with a guide most of the time they've got you know uh they've got some uh type of binocular or something like or they binocular. got you covered right they got you covered now if you do doing it yourself i'll probably go and carry me a little pair where i can get at them if i need to look across a drainage or something like that but um yeah i mean changes in equipment for me or about my, you know, my outer gear, you know, right. my backpack, uh, real light boots, some gaiters, cause it's going to be dewy in the morning, uh, to keep, keep the pants from being all wet and a good pair of great pair of boots and socks. Yeah. And, and, those are huge and deals and, for your feet. And everything gets toned down a little bit. Uh, you know, like you said, the, the binos, if you are going to carry some, they're probably going to be a, a more of a compact size. Uh, range finders you're going to you know most if you're if you're going to shoot pins or something like that you're most likely going to have a small range finder with you and i i see a lot of you know there's no orange (laughs) unless you're hunting in that combo season in colorado when Mm -hmm. there's muzzleloader hunters out there then you better have some orange on yeah and i'd suggest that i mean if there's rifle hunters in the woods or muzzleloader hunters in the woods and you bow hunting i'd put a little orange on at least a cap and and I don't think you have to worry. For me, like I said, I'm a silent freak. So squeaks in my boots, squeaks in my pack, yeah. um, uh, anything like that, you know, my, my boots making noise, being too hard on the bottom. I don't know how many of you guys do this, but when I do buy a pair of boots, I go, man, and I start. I start taking the bottom of that boot and putting on stuff to hear how hard it sounds on mm-hmm. the floor of the store or on mm-hmm. anything, because I don't want something that is making a whole lot of noise out there. Okay. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you can get away out there with just wearing any boots. You can wear any kind of britches. You can wear a good thick coat, you know, that, that whereas now when you go into bow hunt, you got to think like Gilbert says, Quiet. you got to think more layers uh you've got the time of year most of the time in the west here where you're probably going to get rained on in the afternoon and you know that means some kind of rain gear i i don't yeah. wear rain gear per se i always keep a poncho that i wear for something mm-hmm. like that but you got to think about layers you have to think about being able to you know if it gets warm during the day and in the afternoon as that temp goes down starts getting cool and uh you know, so those types of things are different. And I think you go from, you worry more about the scent. You worry more about the noise. You worry more about whether you're broken up. So I think there's just more attention to detail when you change in that equipment. You, you get me on that, bro? I, I do. I mean, bow hunting is all attention to detail. You know, I, I think, of course, we could overkill everything, but I think the better you are at concealment with scent yourself uh being quiet when you draw your bow Mm -hmm, are you you, is there any creaks or cracks Mm -hmm. in that bow is there any of your clothing that sounds like a shower curtain manano Uh, (laughs) at at the end of the day 
those are the things that you really want to delve into and be stealthy, quiet. You know, we were walking back from, from my stand. We got done hunting. We're walking back from my stand and my son stopped me in the middle of the road and he goes, dad, your boots have got a real bad squeak in them. And I went, really? I hadn't heard it. So I started stepping. <laughs> he was 100% right. So I had a piece of that sole that he got up in there and it was starting to rub rubber on rubber right? or a piece of the in, insole of uh-huh. rubber, rubber on rubber. And, you know, I took them apart and put me a little bit of toilet tissue in there to buffer it. And we're down the road and ain't making any more noise, but he heard it. Right. Yeah. So those things are huge, man. Deer don't hear that or neither do elk, you know, that's a foreign sound to them. So, well, that, you know, that's like the, the one sound that drives me nuts in, when I'm guiding rifle hunters and it's just because my bow hunter mentality yeah. is when they got to lock a, sh- a shell in, Ooh. you know, I send mean, an, uh, send an animal into freaking orbit. Yeah. But I mean, when you're, <laughs> when you're 300 yards away, man, you can, yeah. you know, you can do yeah. that thing, but Holy Toledo, <laughs> man. I'm like, Logan and I were sitting in the blind and I had my range finder. And I, I had my release and it's metallic, you know, so I had my range finder and I could hear this woodpecker pecking on the wood. Right. Uh-huh. We got, I mean, literally got deer walking underneath us. Right. Uh-huh. So I go. Uh-huh. And a soul looked up. Right. Uh-huh. Pecker, the woodpecker goes pop, 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 pop. pop. And I go. Just match the tone. And I mean, loud deer ain't never looked up. They know what that sound is. Right, right, yeah, right. You know, as soon as I went to the metal with my with my relief, ting, ting, I mean, <laughs> it changed the whole game, right? Right. They don't hear things that got metal out there, Joe. That's they right. They hear them pecking on the wood and all the all of the natural sounds, like something stepping in the leaves and stuff. They don't pay no right. attention to an armadillo walking around or a bird rustling the leaves and stuff like that. It's movement and it's, odd sounding things that really get their attention that doesn't fit the environment and and that's what we right. tell guys when when you talk about changes in style you know you you <clears throat> want and and you have to remember to always try to match things to your environment and what you're doing so uh changes in habits <laughs> free i mean you know there's got to be more for me the changes you know we're gonna bathe every day you know, mm-hmm. and get scent free and spray down and, you know, just pay more attention to your scent. But everybody tells you, Gilbert, if the wind's right, you ain't got to worry about that. You know, I, I kind of agree with some of that, but mm-hmm. we're still not going to stand in line to get that wind swirling. And, you know, it, whatever you can do to help yourself stay scent free, I think helps, right? Uh, we get a little swirling wind and they might catch a whiff. Hmm, that, you know, that might not alert them enough to, you know, to vacate the country. But when they get a full blown whiff of you without anything, any help, yeah, they're gone. You know? I have always said everything's about getting the biggest advantage, getting the most out of your situation that you can. And yeah. if me being sent free means that an elk gets three yards, five yards, 10 yards closer to me than they would have if I wasn't, then I'm going to take it. You know, I want every advantage. I want to take a, uh, I want to take advantage of every detail that I can to put myself in the best situation. So yeah, that's that's a big change in habit. You know how you how you move through the woods and what you're looking for. You know yeah. is yeah. you're it, it's it's a whole different feel and paying attention to where you are because now guys you know you're not just using those ridge tops and different places and using those bottoms to move in you're you're ending up in places especially you start getting on sign and track and following things you end up in places you ain't never seen before sure, and sure. woodsmanship really comes in key in a lot yeah. of that so some of those woodsmanship habits are are really important always you know, checking uh, your direction, checking the wind, checking uh, yeah. your area, becoming part of it, not just a passenger, becoming an observer, becoming part of it, yeah. I think is is really important. And like I said, for me, my habits are to make sure that, you know, I have everything 
uh, and so that it's as scent free as possible, as quiet as possible, right? Yeah, and you know, I think a, another good thing is we all take for granted every time we pop a broadhead out of a pack, it's as sharp as it can be. Look, you know, for me, if I want to put an animal down, that broadhead needs to be sharp. So, you know, not every day do you check your bullets out when you put them in your rifle or something like that. But I literally spin my arrows most all the time, and I'm checking to make sure that it's got real good cutting surface on it. You know, we can walk around those woods all day. You might get a little bit of surface rust on them or whatever it may be, depending on what kind of blade you're shooting. Mm -hmm. Most of us are shooting mm -hmm. stainless now, mm -hmm. but there are still some guys out there that shoot the old snuffer and those wiki and stuff like that where they're carbon steel, you know? Right. So, I mean, it's going to rust up on you. So, you know, a lot of times <clears throat> when I'm shooting something like that, I shot a land shark for a long while. I put Vaseline on them you know, petroleum right. jelly, just keep them from rusting. So, I mean, there's just a lot of things in your habits that you need to do when you're a bow hunter to, you know, uh, the maintenance you do to your bow, making sure your strings waxed, uh, making sure, you know, your peep sights in good shape. A lot of these freestanding peeps, when you draw them, if they've been, uh, you know, a lot of guys leave their release on their, on their string. Well, that creates some torque in the string. And when you draw it back, a lot of times the people get out of whack. Right. right. So making sure that peak's adjusted at the moment of truth, uh, you know, making sure everything's tight, all your screws are tight. Uh, so it's not making clanking noises and stuff like that. I mean, there's just so many things that go into being a successful bow hunter that one of those things could lead to a blown up situation. Definitely. Uh, and I, th I think I best way to say it is that things get a little bit, they get more magnified in that and yeah because the distance is so much closer yeah everything becomes magnified you know all, yeah. all of those things that we're talking about and that's why you know one of the habits that you have to have is is in your practice regime i mean yeah. you can take your rifle out and you can go out that week and you can make sure that you're shooting good and that you know everything's hitting where it's supposed to now i still tell guys they need to go out and they need to shoot in the time. types of clothes that they're going to hunt in and you they've got to use the if they're going to shoot off sticks they need to do that as well but you know with the bow if they're going to use a decoy they need to shoot with it <laughs> <laughs> i don't know who you're talking about yeah, I don't Manano, you got to keep that straight next time man. <laughs> but, <Exactly. laughs> but you know the the thing is if you're going to hunt with the bow man you're not going to get away with going out and shooting a week i mean you bow oh, hunters, no. <laughs> oh no <laughs> you got to be religious in in your practice and you've got to practice yeah. from from hunting situations you got to practice through limbs over top of things put yourself in and wearing the type of same clothes if you're wearing a face mask that you know mm -hmm. shooting if you shoot if you're going to wear a glove you got to shoot with a glove on you've got to put yourself in all of those situations and practice constantly so that when you get to that moment of truth that one opportunity you have you're not going to have something that's going to show up and blow up right yeah, for sure. I mean, Logan learned a, a prime example of that this past weekend. He, he had some turkeys come in on him. He was wearing a leather glove on his shooting hand because it was really cold. Right. And he never shot with that leather glove. Well, it changed his anchor just a little bit. Yep. He shot about an inch or two high, maybe a little more than that, three inches high over the top of that turkey's back. So we go back to we go back to the house and do some shooting. Sure enough, with the glove, he's about four inches high. When he takes the glove off, dead bullseye Isn't so that crazy huh it, it is mm -hmm. totally different so it's imperative that the attention to detail is very very uh real right, right. i mean hunting with a face mask you've never done that before oh it uh, especially again, i mean because you anchor to your face and you have yes. a feel for that and it's it's like yeah. an old friend and you put something on your hand and you draw back now or you have a face mask and you draw back and yeah. you don't feel that same old friend yeah. it it it's different, man. And yeah, yeah. and I, I, I kind of hate hunting with a face mask because I can't feel my thumb get behind my mm -hmm. ear to the right location. I mean, uh, when I can feel it on my body, I, I, I'm good, right? So I've had to really practice with that face mask on a whole lot. You know? Well, I'm going to tell you guys, so listen to this. It's hard to find these days. I think you can go online to find it, but one of the best face masks out there totally changed. I, I used to do the makeup thing and God, it would take a week to get all that stuff out of my creases and pores and stuff. But I, I found the Spandaflage face mask. Yeah. 
and those things stay conformed to your body. Yeah. You get the same feel through that through that spandoflage. It keeps you warm when it's cooler. It's cool when it's hotter. Yeah. And it is a great, great face cover that lets you still feel those things. And I'm I'm somebody that I shoot instinctive, so it's critical that I feel those yeah. things. And hunting in spandoflage, it's hard to find, but it's an incredible face mask for you guys. That's a tip for you out there. Yeah. And you know, guys that have trouble with anchor points and stuff like that, there is a deal that you can put on your strings called a kisser button Uh and uh, it'll get to the corner of your mouth every time. Uh, You know, yeah. Does it remove some speed from your bow? Mm -hmm, Probably four or five feet per second. But look, I'm going to tell you right now in today's bows where we're all shooting between 250 and 325, I mean, Uh it ain't going to make a hill of beans. You lose three to four feet a second. When you when you're shooting a heavy enough air and a good cut on contact broadhead, but that anchor point every time, if you're having trouble with that, it's duplicatable. And when you can duplicate it, you can get a group. And when you can get a group, you can be sure consistent. That, That's right. Yeah, that consistency is going to drive your harvest rate up. Right. Right. I mean, the biggest thing is about shot placement, and when we can put the arrow where we want it to go, uh, and understand the situations we're going to be really successful. You know, just you were talking about things that slow down the, the bow just a little bit, but if anybody has ever looked at my bow, I not only have uh, dampeners on my main string, right. you'll see I, ha- I have six. I have one on, I got three going across the top on each cable. I got right. three going across the bottom. But when my bow shoots, I do not have an elk duck in when they mm-hmm. hear that noise because my bow is completely, I mean, it, yeah, it's real quiet. It's going real to slow quiet. it down and maybe a, three feet per second, but who cares? It's yeah, a hammer. That's you right. Know, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I'm, I'm real proud of my helium. It's very, very quiet. Uh, and it's super fast and plenty fast for what I've been doing. I've killed a lot of elk. I've killed a lot of deer with it. A lot of other animals. Uh, and listen, they just don't react to it like they do these loud bows. That's another thing, man. You, you know, you want guys want to, you know, have better opportunities and not have animals reacting. Number one, don't shoot at them when they're looking at you and when they're alert. And number two, don't have a bow that's not quiet. Go, Definitely. go shoot it and listen to it, mm-hmm. man. And, and uh, if it sounds like a 22 going off, you need to do some work on it. All you got to do is go shoot with a whole bunch of guys, man. And, and yeah. you'll shoot and guys will go, God dang, that bow's quiet, man. Or, yeah. you know. And when they, when that's real great confirmation. And that's another thing with your habits is to put yourself in that situation, find those 3D shoots, yeah. go get involved, put some pressure on yourself, uh, get shooting with other people around you. It's a great situation to put yourself in because you get all these different angle shots. You have to worry about whacking arrows on trees. It's, it's, it's just super. It's a great time. It's great camaraderie. And it really gets you ready and gets you tuned in, okay? You bet. So let's go to the biggest question we get, Gilbert. And, man, I, I tell you, I get more stuff on. I have guys that text me, and they're like, man, I don't know what's going on, but I I, I sound like a, a, a cat squealing or, or I think I could call in a wolf, but I don't think I'm going to call in an elk, you know, because it, it's all about, you know, learning how to call elk. That's where we get most of our questions from. And uh, Yeah, and, and look, if you're not, you know, it takes time to put in with a diaphragm call. Uh, but there's a bunch of calls out there that you don't have to use a, a diaphragm with sure. that have been killing elk for a long time. Yeah, you know, uh, we, we used to give Chab a hard time about the hoochie mama, you know. It's and, fantastic. Uh, the, the Primo's hoochie mama. And I tell Nothing you what. wrong with it. I know guys that use a diaphragm call in conjunction with the hoochie mama so they can mm-hmm. sound like a, a herd of elk and they get that mm-hmm. variance with the diaphragm call and they get the other noises going at the same time. So that yeah. can be, that can be a, a, a good one to add. I had, uh, I just ordered some of these Gilbert. I ordered some for you guys, man, that I'm going to be sending to you. I got, uh, I got three of them here, but uh, you know, for example, they have this call, the flex oh, mark wow. here. Yeah. The flex right. Mark. And, yeah. You know, it's it's just one of those that all you got to do is just bite on it, get a little bit of practice. If you know, I have never used this one. It came in the mail, and but I don't think it would take too long to. Mm-hmm. 
What is wrong with that, Joe? I mean, goodness <laughs> gracious. What is wrong with that, right? You know? Mercy. I guarantee I'd kill a bull with that. Yeah. And I mean, you can put that with a tube. You could put it with any if you want to. But, yeah. you know, it it hangs around the neck. Uh, it's easy. It's going to be yeah. a cow call. You, can, you know, you can actually... Uh, you get a little sand. bit of variance by where you put your teeth on it, I bet. Mm -hmm. You know, let's see here. I, I've got one that's a flex tone call uh, that Michael Waddell put out, and then you put it between your teeth and you uh -huh. bite down on it. Right. Man, it makes great, great cow sounds. You yeah. Know? It's, you know, you have stuff like that that can help. There's all kinds of uh, – now, I'm not a big external guy, uh, call guy. because I'm not either. Uh, a lot of those it seem, always seem to – because I'm – I don't know if it's, I have more spit in my mouth than most people, but it seems to no, always. I like that call in my mouth because I can get it when I want it. Right. You know, if I need to stop a, stop something to draw, if, you know, there is, it's available to me. I don't have to use my hands. I can draw that bow and get ready, you know. Right. Yeah. And and that's the thing is, is guys, I, I would put the time in to learn a diaphragm call. And, yeah. and, and so most of these questions on where, to get started calling. So I'm going to tell you where to get started calling. I'm going to tell you what, what you need. First of all, you need a grunt tube. There's all kinds of grunt tubes out there. Uh, I have one right here that is brand new uh, from Walmart, 16 bucks. It actually comes with a cover that goes on. It comes with a, a string to put on it. It's the, it's the Carlton Mega uh, grunt tube. And mm -hmm. Um, it's what we've been used for years. This is mine right here. I've lost more of those in the woods over the years, just especially early on. In, in I'm going to tell you right now, if I ever lose mine, I'm going to cry because you give it to me. <laughs> yeah, I hope I hope you hold on to that one for a while. Oh, I'm more, I, 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 I make sure of it. Now, I've left it a couple of times. I had to go back. Yeah. Thank God for Onyx and my GPS. <laughs> and I'll tell you, a lot of people, you know, a lot of guys out there are using uh, those bats grunt yeah, tubes and they these sound days good. And, and and they sound awesome but mm -hmm. for a solo hunter gilbert i Tough i think to do. yeah i i just don't think that they help you out and let me just tell you why uh guys my whole goal as, as when i'm calling in an elk is to bring that elk at animal into mm -hmm. me when i call at that animal that that grunt to projects volume at that animal if you're projecting volume at that animal that bull thinks you are closer to it than what you are and so yeah. now that bull is going to stop at a certain point and is going to want you to show yourself because it should be seeing you at that point sure and now if i as a solo hunter if i have a bull coming in and starting to hang up at 80 yards and i want to get that bull to come in closer well my biggest trick is i have this wrapped around my body it goes under my armpit i can bring it up to my mouth i actually have it you know with the string over my body it just hangs right under my arm just like this i can slide it up and i can call into it with it calling behind me now to do that with a bat tube gilbert you know what you have to do yeah it's a three ring circus you you, you got to turn yeah you, you have to turn now this is not what i'm wanting to do now mm -hmm. i imagine i could try to get that down below my arm right here and try to get it so it's going down towards the ground i could i could try that and, mm -hmm. and see how that works if i had a bat i would be trying that yeah. but uh, I just think one of these that conforms to your body that, that moves like that is so much more conducive. And the big thing is, if I have to move in and stock up on an animal, I just take that string, Push slide it. that towards my back, and I'm moving nice yeah. and quiet. So uh, that's, that's one reason I like these flexible tubes with, with a cover on them wrapped around my body. So that's what I like yep. to use. So whatever you guys want to get, this is just what I use. And so I'm just telling you, in fact, I think everybody in our camp uses this style, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, For sure. So you need that. Diaphragm callers, diaphragm calls, diaphragm reads uh, for you to purchase. I'm going to tell you that, uh, first of all, you guys that if you turkey hunt and you use a, a turkey diaphragm, you're already ahead of the game. You guys are ready to rock. But for those of you guys that are trying to figure out what to start with, I'm going to tell you what I think are some of the, the best calls for beginners for ease use. 
And I'm not saying beginners as this is a beginner call. I call, I've been calling out with these calls for years. They are my go-to calls, but I still believe for beginners, they're easier to get sounds out right away. Uh, you can go to Elk 101, or you can go to Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls, and you're going, you can look up the Green All-Star, the Orange Champ, and the White Contender. What all I love, good calls. All great calls, and they fit your in your palate, and that's what it's all about. It's about a palate fit. Now, there's a lot of us that have different philosophies about starting people out. Some people say, you know, well, if they have a wide palate, you don't want it to be one of those smaller ones that go in there. But mm -hmm. I, for most guys, I have found you can always go wider, but you get a wide when you put it in there, it's, it, you're going to struggle. So I think mm -hmm. I'd rather go in the other direction. You get yeah, those. I trim mine all the time, Joe. Yeah, right. I trim it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just because your palate's really narrow, right? It so is. You got to yeah. trim it up even more. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think those three calls out of the box can you can get sounds going, right? No and, doubt, no doubt. Uh, for for me, it's the black primos. I mean, I, I don't know what it is. Now there's several times I got to go through a couple of them to get the right sound I want. And, and a lot of it's tuning it, you know, uh, but that green, that blue, the black and the white one, man, so, I'm telling you. So for you and I, the, the black and the white primos have been pretty much our, our go-to diaphragm calls for years. Yeah. But the only problem I have for beginners, though, Gilbert, with that is, yeah, is that you do have to tune them a tune little them. bit. Yeah. No uh, doubt. Those other ones you mentioned straight out of the package. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, sound man. really good. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about tuning it. I think these primos last a good long time where some of these oh other gosh. ones will start to blow out a little bit. And the other one that I just tried here lately was this, was this Phelps gray amp. And mm -hmm. it's, it's basically the same type of format. If you take a look at that, it's kind of the, mm -hmm. if, if you look at the dome on the top of it, mm -hmm. you can see like that dome, that pallet dome, and they're kind of the same format. One's plastic, one's uh, metal there. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, it pops in, it fits in, it kind of guides it into your palate, makes it really easy to get a call off that. And for you guys that are just starting out, this is the front of the call right here. That's mm -hmm. going to go towards your eye teeth. It's going to go in just like that in the top of your palate. That's called a palate plate because it's going to actually, that palate dome is going to go up inside your palate. And basically, this is going to be right about even with your eye teeth. It's different for different folks. And you can actually move the diaphragm forward and backward for different types different of sound, calls. Yeah. But don't worry about that. This is talking about you getting started. And it so just you get, noise. yeah, you, you get, you get any of those Rocky Mountain hunting calls, or you can go to Elk 101 and find them, uh, or you get that amp gray, you're going to be in the money. That's something for you to start out with. And somebody asked me, do I want to be biting? Because you have, you can see, you know, Gilbert was talking about trimming off to make it fit here in the side. Mm -hmm. Well, some guys think they have to bite down on that. No, it all mm -hmm. goes up in there and your tongue pressure holds that into the top of your mouth. And, That's right. you know, uh, just start making a sound. You know, when you get that in your mouth, you start making noises. Hang on, I was looking around for Luis. Where's Luis at? I was looking around for him. You just want to start making some noises, man. Don't don't worry about sounding a certain way. Just start playing, getting control. And right now, you can see I'm not holding it with my tongue, uh, and it's sitting up in the top of my palate. It creates a seal up there with yeah. the tape around it. So that's going to get you get you started up there. So I recommend those calls for you to start. Now, you want to start learning and getting some things that are going to help you. Uh, you know, Elk Bros is working on something for you at one point, but I tell you what, guys, I I don't care where you go to be successful. I'm going to tell you some of the best places. Get on the internet. Look up Paul Medell, M-E-D-E-L, the, the Elk Nut. Paul mm -hmm. is incredible, and, you know, when you 
watch how he does it and you try to mimic him, try to mimic yeah. his sound. Corey Jacobson of Elk 101 has incredible stuff out there. Michael Batiste is phenomenal. And what yeah. a great guy. Michael is just fantastic. If you, if you want to learn about elk habits and listen to sounds, because I think the best way to learn to call elk is to try to mimic elk. Mm -hmm. And if you go uh, look up Chris Rose, uh, look up that name, R-O-E, on the web, uh, on, in YouTube, you'll get to places where you can hear all kinds of elk vocalizations. And Chris, man, Chris will tell you what those elk are saying, you know. No doubt. And yeah. uh, it, it's just great stuff to listen to and start building that database up on the, the different things on that. But I'm going to give you some key points, guys, when you're getting started. Number one, keep it simple. Don't worry about doing uh, a buzz. Don't worry about, um, uh, you know, doing a challenge and or doing, yeah. a, you know, all these different type of, of noises. Uh, don't even worry about doing a chuckle. Just try to get yourself a good, nice cow call. Try to get yourself just a nice, good bugle and go from there. So keep it simple. Yeah, because, man, I'm telling you that those two things will make hay. I'm telling you. Yeah. Good, soft quiet cow call, <clears throat> you know, and uh, a good bugle that t t tells another bull, hey, here's another bull in my area. I mean, it gets the juices flowing. So, Gilbert, I was going to show you something else that, you know, we got these new products that we're trying. We're always testing stuff out. And you talked about a quiet cow call. This little gadget is basically called the Game Changer. And the whole idea is it has baffles inside of it that create back pressure so that a person can call into this instead of a, a, a regular grunt tube. If, if you didn't have the big one, you can use this here and you can get some noises. But here's what's so cool. Listen to the cow call difference, right? Mm -hmm. All right. But listen now. It wow. takes that takes that tone it. and it takes yeah. it down some, makes it a little bit yeah. quieter. You can even get some real good raspy stuff in that. Sure. You can hear it on there. Uh, yeah. And so this is something that I've been playing with a little bit. Going the other way, I haven't heard a whole lot of difference. Um, I, I'm still playing with that and the jury's out on things, but I tell you what. <laughs> it refines that call a little bit, makes I, it a little softer. You know, I tell you, you keep this in so it's in your pack or in something where you can get to it and something happens where you lose your grunt tube, buddy, you're in the money. You're no still doubt. going on, right? So no uh, that's something there that uh, uh, it's just something to think about later on. Now, other key points. Always remember that it's more about air volume than tongue pressure because some guys to get high pitched – They'll start pushing that tongue really, really hard, and you can get those high pitches just by putting volume out. It's sure. more about that volume than it is. If you keep putting that hard pressure on that diaphragm call, you wear them puppies out real quick. You'll stretch yeah. that latex out. So uh, think about that, all right? And, guys, I, I guess the other thing is, is remember there's no perfect – elk bugle out there oh man so, i've heard some horrible ones yeah like man old boy's in tough shape like he's he ain't got no elk bugle right. you know it's, <laughs> i mean seriously yeah. like what was that <clears throat> joe say well that's an elk bugle and i'm like that is not an elk bugle <laughs> <laughs> right. and i've heard him the other way man i've heard him like ee! you know yeah. it just yeah, just uh, crazy stuff, man. They start getting worn out, you know. Yeah, when you're in the woods, you don't know whether that's another hunter or whether it's a real elk. But right. as Joe always says, go find out. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And Gilbert, you know what? Mm -hmm. uh, I saw Michael uh, Waddell do this. You just had that water bottle up there in a pinch. Oh, you yeah. cut out the bottom of that water bottle right there, and you can – call right out through that and if you, if you needed yeah. something in a pinch so you just could. something to create some volume you could do that all right yep all right but i bottom they're all resourceful joe yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, guys from the stuff that we just talked about 
if it got those wheels turning and you develop some questions or anything like that, just send them in to us at info at elkbros.com, I-N-F-O at elkbros.com. Send the questions in. We'll try to answer them. In fact, speaking of that, Gilbert, let's go to our Elk Bros mailbox. Awesome, brother. All right. So uh, please, guys, uh, just a reminder, uh, if you're listening to this, I know a lot of you are in the car or you're in the gym or you're out hiking or something like that. When you get back, do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to us. So whenever we drop one of these, it pops up. It automatically downloads for you. And please rate and leave a review. We really uh, want to hear from you. We want to hear how we're doing. And uh, it really makes our day. I tell you what, we go back to check for reviews. And when you haven't gotten one in a month, you're like, wow, man, are we doing something wrong here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man, it's so important for the guys to rate and review us, man. It's, it's really important. I mean, you know, we're over 50 shows now. And uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's taken off like wildfire. We appreciate our listeners, but as usual, we can, we can always use more. Oh, I tell you what, lately they've been, they've been really coming in. So that, that's really cool to see that. So we're, we have questions here. We have three people up in our mailbox. Um, we'll see how far we get on these as we go. Philip Esslinger from Aurora, Nebraska is going to be up first. Then um, in our list then is Paul Snowart from, get this, <laughs> Wyoming, Minnesota. Heck of a deal. Yeah, Wyoming, Minnesota. That, that, that I just threw me when I saw that. I was like, oh, Wyoming, yeah, man, what the heck? And then uh, <laughs> the last one is from Steve. I don't know where Steve's from. Uh, I think his question, he just wanted to keep it at Steve. So uh, we're going to start with Philip. And Philip's question was, he says, uh, you mentioned in your Elk Bros podcast secrets that you enjoy getting out early. <laughs> enjoy. I don't know why I enjoy it, but <laughs> you enjoy getting out early in the morning before some people <laughs> are even getting to the trail. What time are you getting out? Thank you for the great podcast. Thank you, Philip, man. <clears throat> well, allow me to embellish a little bit. Uh, Joe is by far the best elk guide I've ever hunted with. And I've hunted with several. But uh, Joe understands the habit of the elk moon phase, wind direction. And he also understands that if he's got a herd found, he's going to get out there as early as he can to try and position himself in the right position to make that work. So Joe, I've seen Joe get up at three in the morning and go and shadow a herd and then come back, wake me up at four 30. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's the kind of guy Joe is. Right. So, I mean, I can let Joe elaborate from there, but I've seen him go at three o'clock. I've seen him go at four 30, but we're usually up out in the woods you know, a good hour and a half, you know, yeah. sometimes two hours before daylight. Yeah. I, I, I want to be out there in the area, uh, two hours before, uh, one hour minimum, yeah. you know, if, if that, if that's what's happening. So it gets gray light. Like if it gets, if, if you have legal shooting light at six o'clock, you got gray light at like five thirty, And, and I like, to be able to see the woods coming alive at gray light and be in position in gray light is how I like to do things. Yes, I know you're thinking <laughs> we've walked right in the middle of in the middle of them. And I'm like, Joe, stop. He's like, What's up? I'm like, dude, I think that's an elk like right there. He goes, give me my binoculars. <laughs> so I pull him out of his pack and hand it to him and he goes, hmm. You're right. That is milk. <laughs> You're right in the middle of the herd. It's it's cool, man. Because I mean, you I couldn't see hardly anything, but I seen a little bit of a movement in that right. gray light. In that gray light, yeah. Bingo, man. We're in the middle of them, and yep. it was Katie bar the door there for about thirty minutes. I, I I'm not able to tell you how many times, guys, that. I've located, and what I really like to do when I get out there, the first thing I like to do is I just like to cow call just a little uh, sweet cow call over where it can bounce over an area. And and then I listen because a lot of times, because we hunt early season, a lot of times those bulls will talk right back and do the same thing. They'll give that that cow call. It's really a bull call, okay, a bow call, yeah. I call it. And and you can locate them. And I start they moving do, in. They do that. They do that. 
to yeah. a lot of times. Or, or they'll it. just give you a little grunt. You think it'd be a cow. Mm-hmm. You think it'd be a bovine cow, and it ain't. It's a bull. Or they'll you give know? a little grunt, a chuckle, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of my most pristine time to be in the woods with uh-huh. you because I know you're going to call. I can. I, I know we're going to have just a few little calls, and I can lay back in that pine straw or wherever we're at and just take it in, listen. And right. listen to the nature come alive around you and the bulls talking. And a lot of times we get them answering and we're like, oh, boy, we're just waiting on the light. I mean, yeah. we're like a kid before Christmas, you know. Right. So, But that's the coolest thing in the world to sit out there underneath the good Lord stars and, and uh, moonlight or whatever it may be and let out a few little cow calls or even a location bugle. And then bingo, one answers you. And you're like, yep. oh, yeah. And then, you know, we, we start cutting the distance, uh, yeah. and you gotta be careful because, you know, when you make that cow call, you're, you're sound like a girl out there They could be coming into you. So you gotta be careful, you know, and yeah, be slow and methodical about it. You don't have to go rushing in on it, you know, take a look at, you know, your watch and know what time it's going to get daylight and just start to make it happen. So guy, like I said, I'm out there two hours, one hour uh, before gray light minimum. Okay, that's that's what I like to be. Otherwise, I feel like I've already lost out. I'm not able to tell you how many times I have shot an animal at daylight and beyond that animal start working it. And I start hearing four wheelers or stuff like that. People just getting out of camp. So uh, it's huge to your advantage to be on those animals ASAP. Right. Yeah. Also, guys, check your reg. You know your rules and regulations in each state. A lot of states have rules and regulations on what times you can and can't sure. shoot. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you, I'm, like here in Texas, we're you know uh, thirty minutes before sunrise. Before, before and, sunrise, right? And, and I think we, that's pretty yeah. standard. Right. And then, and for migratory birds, it's sunset. Right. Uh, not it's up to sunset, and then for any everything after that, it's thirty minutes after sunset. Right? Exactly. So, right. But for migratory birds here, it is sunset, so right. it can get confusing. But uh, check your rules and regulations so you don't get yourselves in a bind. And there's a reason for that, y'all. Man, is that it's hard safety. for you to really make out things in solid shapes correctly. And it's a safety issue. It really mm-hmm. is. So uh, follow, follow the laws on that. Great question, Philip. I hope we helped you brother. Yeah. From Aurora, Nebraska, Philip, you're the man. Okay. So up next was Paul Snort out of Wyoming, uh, Minnesota. And uh, his first question was, it says, uh, I'm planning a trip to Idaho for general season archery. Okay, so that means general season when a lot of guys are going to be out there. I'm able to, to take two weeks in September and can't decide which weeks to take. I planned on taking the 12th to the 27th, but a coworker told me that I should go earlier due to it's the last two weeks of archery and the elk have been pushed around. Can you give me your advice on what two weeks you would think would be beneficial? I'm doing my first solo archery trip. Okay. So. Well, we looked at that, Joe. Yes, we did. 12th through the 27th is going to be solid. It's going to be solid. Yes, sir, it is. And, you know, remember this, Paul, that rut and what's happening to it, the pre, the rut, the post is all dependent on cows coming in estrus and that happens right around the fall equinox the fall equinox is september 22nd so that 12th to the 22nd is prime time and it's also if i i I don't remember the exact days of uh of of the moon but if i remember right that that's dark moon around that time right there right Yes, sir. Okay, because we we did do a whole special on that. And, yeah, and, uh, and, it, and Paul, go back and check out our podcast earlier. Right. Uh, it could be two or three podcasts ago. Go back to YouTube and look at, you know, setting up your hunt and uh, different moon phases and stuff like that. It'll give you and, – and watch it on YouTube because you'll see the actual calendar pop up. Right, Paul. but let me tell you what, and that's stuff about – 
you know, people being out there and pushing them around. around. Remember this, elk's number one priority is to breed, and they are going to breed no matter what. And when they're breeding, they are susceptible. And 12th to the 27th bud is high cotton. So no I, I think you're good to go. All right. You bet. Are there going to be other people around there? Uh, the one thing I would recommend is avoid the weekends mm -hmm. and hunt the weekdays. So uh, I would use the weekends. If you want to hunt them, fine. There's no skin off your nose, but th that's a great time. Also, if you need to do any recovery stuff, you know, when everybody's in the hills and stuff like that. So you can, you know, go, you know, replenish your food or, uh, you know, get things cleaned up that you need to because two weeks, it's, it's a, that's a stint. All right. No doubt. Paul, I recommend you kill the bull on September 12th. That's my birthday. I recommend it for you. Get her done, <laughs> brother. <laughs> uh, and we want to see the picture, man. Absolutely. And good luck. Good. <laughs> oh, and I hope you have a plan because if you're hunting solo, bud, uh, you better have a plan for getting that animal out of there. Okay. Yep. Uh, question two, where I hunt is very pressured. He's again, this is, this is, and he's hunting archery. Mm -hmm. And I've been listening to hear if there are any strategies to play off of other hunters. I know y'all said that they won't push them clear to another County, but I've been thinking that if there is a scenario where there are others, hunt, where there are other hunters pushing them, that I may be able to head them off on the next Ridge. I saw a video where a hunter observed other hunter, checking the wind with his indicator and tried to move in on a bull in case he pushed him his way. But the bull winded both of them, ruining his plan. Uh, the bulls and cows then went up to a finger embedded on the opposite ridge. You know, uh, there's a lot of things to this question whew, right here. Man, no doubt. A lot of moving parts. Yeah, because uh, there, there's some things that I would tell you, is there a strategy to play off other hunters? Yeah. If you know what their strategy is. Right. And if, you know, the thing is, if, if I come across a hunter that's working an area, just because a hunter's in an area doesn't mean they're spooking the elk out. That's I right. have watched multiple times where a hunter will go through an area and uh, I've watched elk stay there, watch them, let them go by and still be there. Uh, elk are very adaptable. They're very intelligent. And if they feel threatened, yeah, they're going to get out of the area. If they smell something in their area that they're not seeing, yeah, they're going to get out of the area. But a lot of times I've seen them see hunters and let that hunter go by, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's crazy. So if I see other hunters working there and I know that, man, maybe they have the wind wrong and they could be pushing everything out that I think is going to be in there. I'm going to go over top of the ridge and hunt the other side of the ridge. Um, and so hunting, you know, where you think they're going to make animals move to is, is, is a strategy. But there's something here that bothered me, Gilbert. And it was like where he said that, you know, he saw a video where a hunter observed another hunter and then started moving on the bull, hoping that he'd push him his way. Um, not cool as far as I'm concerned, sure. Paul. Uh, if I see a, if I, if I hear calling and I come in and I'm working to where a bull is bugling and I come up and I see guys that are working that animal, dude, I'm, I'm turning and I'm out of there. I'm out. Yeah. yeah I'm out. Uh, if I would expect the same courtesy. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, it's one of those unwritten rules. It's some of the etiquette out there. But if somebody's working an animal, don't put your don't put more scent in the area. Don't put more noise in the area. That is not your hunting partner. That's somebody else out there hunting. Yeah. Let them. They're on that animal. Let them work it, man. First come, first serve. All right. Uh, yeah, you know, Paul, we had this happen to Joe and I this year uh, when Joe killed his bull. I mean, we called some hunters in. Uh, they were, you know, kind of after that same group we were after, uh, it was a, a man and his son and, uh, look, we were ready to acquiesce and give them the rest of that, oh, whatever yeah. they were hunting. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Heck yeah. Oops. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. We were ready to acquiesce and move on. You know, we had a lot of miles left to cover. Uh, we knew they were going to be in that area. So we let them have it. And, uh, I'm telling you, we didn't go 200 yards and here we are back in elk, right? So maybe even less than that. And, uh, yeah. Well, in fact, 
uh, w- we had that discussion. When we, you know, we asked them, what's your what plan? plan was. Yeah. yeah. And they said where they plan to go. In fact, they were like, you know, I saw some, I saw a bull and some cows cross the fence line over there and head up to that ridge, but we're going to head over this way. And we're like, cool, we'll head up the ridge. Yep. I mean, we worked together. We did. And we did to help it, one another. Yeah. To help one another. And yep. it worked out a great situation for us both. Mm-hmm. So um, now, if you are watching from afar and you see somebody working some animals and the and the elk go up on a ridge and bed down and they move out of the area, oh, man, Fair yeah, game. now you're going to go work those critters because sure. they're no longer under somebody's uh, – there's not somebody else working those animals, okay? Yeah. So uh, – I would, I would caution you too when you move in ridges, make sure your thermals are right because – if you get below those critters and the thermals start going, you just bump them to another ridge, right? Yeah. So you yeah, need most to get definitely. above them and you need to get above them immediately and start that, that ascent to them. But man, if you try to get in below them and work up, they're going to bust you every time. Yeah. And, and to go in there and try to jump on somebody else's animal that mm-hmm. they're working and it's not cool, bro. So right. that's not something you want to do. Go over a ridge um, or know how those animals are going to move if those guys are pushing them and go find another place or, you know, turn around and go the opposite way. I mean, I've yeah. done that plenty of times, you know, yep. so uh, that's what we what we would do anyway. Good luck, Paul. Uh, I think we're going to hold off on Steve's till the next time we do our mailbox, bro, because we're okay. at uh, we're at time now. Man, and uh, again, another great show, Joe. Yeah, Fantastic I think fun. content. Mm-hmm. Uh, these guys that are going to put the smoke poles down and grab their bows. I mean, that's a lot of good stuff for them to get started with. You know, definitely got to change their habits a little bit. Definitely got to play a little more attention to detail and uh, and prepare a little bit different. You know, right. uh, we implore guys. I mean, look, there's nobody going to tell you that they love bow hunting more than myself and Joe and the guys we run with. Right. Uh, I, like I said, I want guys supporting one another, whether they want to shoot one with a, a slingshot or whether they want to shoot it with a bow and arrow or, or a gun. I mean, absolutely. I don't think any less of a man that loves to bow hunt or, or loves to gun hunt than worse than I, I love to bow hunt. So, yeah. Um, uh, all fantastic stuff, just about supporting each other and, and what we love to do. And we all, bottom line, love to elk hunt, that's for sure. Yep. Guys, uh, again, we'd like to ask you, man, if you like what we're doing, if you if you uh, appreciate the stuff that we're doing, please subscribe, rate, and review us. You, you have to go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes to be able to review us. Uh, if that's uh, difficult for you, fine man we just love having you as a listener but we would appreciate the rating and your subscribing to us okay and as always gilbert they can check out more elk content where at elkbros.com bro there you go yes sir hey and uh i wanted to let everybody know i know everybody out there is thinking about chav and we appreciate all the continued prayers and everything most Chav's getting stronger bigger faster uh, everything's going in the right direction. So he, he has uh, a round four of chemo coming up. Um, a, a lot of tests coming up. We're, we're really, uh, guys, we could appreciate your prayers. He's got a PET scan after that, uh, fourth round and we'll find out, you know, uh, what's happening with the cancer, man. So we, we um, want him to know we love him and we, we, uh, we're all pulling for him and, uh, and, and, you know, he's in our prayers every night, Joe. Yep. And, but this one's for you always always one for you guys it's been a fantastic show for joe in new mexico i'm gilbert ornelas here in in spring texas we ask all our husband to kiss their wives and wives kiss their husbands hug your babies keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry and we'll see you right here next week on blue collar elk peace peace